Hello, welcome back, Scouted Football Podcast fans. Uh, we're recording in the immediate aftermath of England being knocked out of the Under-21 European Championships. Um, two defeats to Switzerland and Portugal did the damage in the end, uh, meaning a 2-1 win over Croatia in the final group game wasn't enough to see them go through. There are already a mass of questions being asked yet again, the same sort that were posed after England's exit from the same competition in 2019 uh, about AD Boothroyd's role as under-21 boss and, and who could potentially replace him if the FA take that decision. Uh, lots of names being floated about, uh, but I think the right choice would probably be an up-and-comer, an up-and-coming coach, perhaps one who's not on everybody's lips, mainly because you know I think fresh ideas are needed for the, the under-21 setup as, as well as somebody who's probably going to fit the FA's wage structure. Um, but, I mean, that that's enough talking about England. Um, they're out. There are plenty of teams, plenty of exciting young players who will be taking part in the knockout rounds between May 3rd 31st and June 6th this year Um, and keep an eye out on our Patreon in the coming week as uh, we'll have a group stage review podcast coming out there for subscribers. Um, But on to this week though uh, and back to more of a club football focus. Um, Chelsea is our topic of discussion um, which it's fair to say is a pretty broad one. Um, Fortunately I have Orlando Ashton with me to break things down into manageable chunks and separate discussion points. Um, Orlando founded the Chelsea spot which is the go-to for for Chelsea analysis, opinion, um, stats, the, and, and everything like that. Um, how are you doing, mate? Are you basking in a, a little bit of the, a mini March heat wave? Yeah, it's lovely, lovely here in London. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm really, really excited for this podcast. Really happy to be here. Um, looking forward to it. Yeah, likewise. I've been sort of keen to get a, a Chelsea one out of the way. Um, in, for, for quite a while but it's kind of been it's one of those ones that I've just put off because there's been more I don't know topical ones that have come around but I've thought you know what during the international break I may as well do a sort of a little deep dive and, and see what see what we, we we throw up but um yeah in in terms of the Chelsea spot um you know how did how did you sort of get that underway and what sort of things do you do you do what do you offer um well we started at the beginning of the very first lockdown at the beginning of the pandemic so that was sort of march 2020 um we started a twitter account we started a podcast that podcast is still producing regular content um and you know i'm the regular host of that um and we we produce articles we produce you know threads on twitter sometimes um yeah it's it's um good fun and yeah i'm pleased to be a part of it yeah absolutely so of course you you're a, you're a chelsea fan um and and obviously a, a, an england supporter but you know we'll not get into the the stuff about uh, the, the 21s or we'll be here for years <laughs> exactly but in terms of chelsea focusing completely on on club football um you know growing up who sort of were your your chelsea heroes well, when you say the word hero, I think the first name that instantly comes to mind is Didier Drogba, because as a Chelsea fan, there is really nothing that compares to that Champions League win in 2012. Um, and obviously, that he scored the winning penalty, scored the equaliser in the 87th minute to, to send the game to extra time. But, you know, he was the ultimate big game player. So it wasn't just that game that he won Chelsea trophies in. He scored, you know, a million times at Wembley. It was his playground. Um, one other player who is, I guess, more of a cult hero who I absolutely loved was Joe Cole. Um, I always love players who are good problem solvers. Um, and I really found that that was the case with, with him. I thought he, he was brilliant at finding ways out of sort of tight situations that you never really saw when watching. He's a really kind of intelligent player and I loved watching him too. That's the first time I've actually heard a player be described as a problem solver. Um, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna steal that. Um, not even gonna ask. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna take no, it and welcome. describe people as problem solvers um, from now on. But no, Didier Drogba. I think that is sort of a, yeah. I, I can't can't disagree with you there. That that Champions League final was just sort of one of those mesmeric games where. You know, the, the run, I mean, everything just encapsulated that run with Di Matteo and that team, you know, yeah. Ryan Bertrand at left back and uh, against, you know, the might of Bayern Munich in their own backyard and that header. I think as far as headers go, that's possibly the best I've ever seen yeah. because of what was riding on it. The time of the game, the, just the sheer force, like it, it throws Manuel Neuer back into the goal. Um, and then obviously the, the fairy tale of him uh, scoring the winning penalty as well, sort of, you know, uh, breaking down and just oh, it's it, it's one of those where it, it's it, I think it comes close uh, and it's quite topical at the moment, but it comes very close to sort of the Aguero moment for, from a neutral perspective yeah. for me. But um, I, I quite like that Joe Cole shout as well. Um, obviously, in that same team, that that sort of uh, 
iconic era for for Chelsea in the in the mid two thousands was um, was was Frank Lampard, obviously who who left the club at the end of last year. Um, I, I, I've I've seen conflicting views, or at least I did at the time, um, surrounding Lampard's departure. But what was your what was your stance on it? Well, I think. It was definitely a harsh sacking. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Chelsea weren't doing terribly. And, you know, Lampard had done lots of good things, particularly in his first season, like bringing in lots of academy graduates, massively improving the squad, you know, just from a general standpoint, not just the the young guys. And then he he went and brought in some really big name new signings in, in the summer transfer window. So at the time when he was sacked, I felt that it didn't make much sense to sack him mid-season, particularly so soon after Chelsea had gone on that like 14 match, I think it was, unbeaten run. Um, but I have to say that I have since been proved wrong. You know, you got the feeling at the time that Chelsea weren't completely dead set on Thomas Tuchel as Lampard's replacement, which is quite evident in the fact that he was only offered a, an 18-month contract. But, you know, he's been excellent so far and I, I can't really have too many complaints. So I guess I've got to just say that, you know, credit goes to, you know, Marina Granovskaya, Roman Abramovich and whoever else was involved in making that decision. Yeah, I think ultimately it comes down to the fact that you support a football club, you don't sort of support a club icon. And, yeah. and obviously while Frank Lampard is that is that figure, you know, ultimately the the benefit of the club has to come first and foremost, I think. And and I think um, Chelsea fans that I know certainly were a bit sort of heartbroken to, to begin with, to, you know, with him having to leave the club. And it was, I mean, I, I wouldn't quite say it was acrimonious, but it was it was one of those which probably left a little bit of a bad taste. Um, so, yeah, I think they, they're, they're probably in the same camp as you in the sense that, you know, it's, it's one of those where you probably Thomas Tuchel's come in and, you know, has really shored up the defense and and has just and has been playing you know good football. It's it's been effective, if not you know enthralling. Um, and that's probably you know when you're when you're a billionaire owner of a, a wealthy football club, that's kind of what you want. You want a return on your your investment, essentially, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, as you say, it was you know sad for Chelsea fans to see, particularly myself as Lampard, such a hero. Um, to see him depart but you know it wasn't under the worst circumstances it's not like he was a terrible manager he did some really good things for the club particularly you know from with a long-term perspective you know bringing in the academy graduates um, and that has kind of led to a change in sort of attitude at the club it looks like there's going to be much uh, more of a focus in the coming years of um, integrating academy graduates into the first team which you know has been such a a bad point of Chelsea throughout the 2010s. Um, so, you know, he's, it's not like he, he did only bad things. It was more of a sort of amicable, amicable sacking. Yeah, I know exactly where you're coming from. But on, on the topic of Tuchel, then, you know, obviously this, the start has been successful um, for, for want of a better term. Um, and, one of the things that I think was, I mean, this is purely speculation. I wouldn't have any sort of knowledge on this whatsoever, but I think perhaps one of the reasons why uh, Tuchel was, was brought in would be to sort of get the best out of that, you know, that big summer investment, you know, 120 odd million on Timo Werner and Kai Havertz, you know, that perhaps wasn't ticking to the, to the, you know, the level that was expected of them un- under Lampard. It, I mean, there's still been a bit of stuttering with, with Havertz, but how have you sort of assessed um, his, his first your know, six eight months as a, as a Chelsea player um well I think he had a slow start um but there are reasons for that you know this is quite obvious but at, he was only 21 he's moving countries in the middle of a pandemic to a new league to a new style of play new teammates at times a new position I think it would have been perfectly acceptable at the start of se- at the start of the season to have said that we weren't going to see the best of Kai Havertz in a Chelsea shirt until next season, you know, to allow him that time to adapt. Particularly, we've seen lots of players coming over from the Bundesliga to the Premier League. You know, they do need that sort of adaption time, especially a young player. Um, but what Tuchel's done, you know, he's lots of there's the narrative in the press that you know Tuchel's German, Kai Havertz is German, and you know he's unlocked him as such I don't think that's quite the case but what I don't know how many people realize this but what Tuchel has actually done is he just gave Havertz a break um you know he seems to see have seen that he was struggling as he wasn't struggling but he wasn't you know playing his best football and he essentially just left him out of the team for a while it was vaguely reported that he was injured but there was never really any clarification on what that injury was and I suspect that there was never such a thing um he played 90 minutes in Tuchel's first game, 
he was actually one of the brightest players um and he nearly scored the winner from from a corner which was the last kick of the game actually I think but you know he then I think he played 10 minutes off the bench in the next game against Burnley before going five games completely out of the squad and eight games without a start before that game against Everton where he played as a number nine and he looked really promising and that's where the this sort of narrative that I'm talking about started um I actually said when Chelsea first signed him that I thought he'd be best in the Premier League at least at first as a sort of withdrawn number nine in a front two and you know that was also taking taking into account the other players that Chelsea have in the squad as well because there are lots of many potential strike partnerships in the squad I thought it would be a squad very suited to a front two that didn't quite materialize but where he's played in that game against Everton and also the following game against Leeds as a as a sort of you might want to call it a stretch number nine in a narrow front three is actually a very similar sort of role to a withdrawn number nine in, in a front two you know with the two I guess you you can call them wide number tens often coming in behind and then Havertz dropping deep or making late arriving runs into the box that we so often saw him do at Bayer Leverkusen as a number 10 um, and you know against Everton he looked excellent there Um, but he played as a number 10 on the left-hand side in fact against Atletico Madrid in the Champions League and he was absolutely brilliant as well Um, you know he's completely unplayable really in transition he's got he's got a really unique skill set Havertz where he's he's very tall um, and he's strong and he's also deceptively fast Um, but he's also really incredibly dexterous and silky in fact Um, He's somewhat, you know, particularly from a Chelsea fan perspective, somewhat reminiscent of Ruben Loftus-Cheek in that. Um, but he's also slightly different. The great thing about him is that he's he's really two-footed and he's got the ability to go sort of left or right on either side. So, you know, with that unique skill set of being tall but also dexterous, he has a real unpredictability to go with that. Um, and that, you know, makes him a real nightmare to defend against. Yeah, certainly. I think I agree with what you're saying in terms of him, him being, you know, very good in transition. Obviously, that was something that we saw, uh, you know, massively at, at Bayer Leverkusen. And, and and I do agree with what you're saying about him being deceptively quick. You know, when you think of Kai Havertz, you don't immediately think, oh, yeah, he's got great pace, great speed. But when you're that tall and you're that sort of dexterous, as you say, and effective at moving the ball really quickly, then, yeah, you may, you may I mean, obviously, you, you don't look as quick as a sort of a, a five foot four tricky winger, mm-hmm. but you... You 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 are you're effectively covering more ground at a faster pace. So yeah, I mean if if we're if we're talking about it that way, then yeah, certainly. Um, on on Tuchel though, uh, in terms of the um the 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 players that he has at his disposal, of course, the contract that he signed, as you mentioned, was was for eighteen months. And you know, there's there's such a you know a rich seam of of, of talent in the the twenty threes at Chelsea within the academy as well. Is do you feel that it's perhaps a short termist appointment, and that maybe there's not going to be too much of an emphasis on the younger players from Tuchel because simply that just doesn't you know the, developing them isn't in his remit. You know his remit is is eighteen months, and you know to 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 go, to get as high up the table within those eighteen months as as he, as he can. Well, I'm not sure I agree with that. I think. Tuchel's been very clear in his press conferences when he's been asked about this 18 month contract 18 month contract that he he really didn't care at all. He basically said that um initially he was a bit worried by it, but then he realized that um actually if even if he signed a five year contract, if they weren't happy with him after 18 months, they'd just sack him anyway. You know, that's what Chelsea do. They're really famous for doing that. So he doesn't seem to have any issues with that. He seems to be quite confident that, you know, if he performs well, as he is doing now, he will be offered an extension. So I'm not sure if it's particularly a short-termist appointment. Um, But, you know, as you say, the sort of development of young players not being in his remit was the one thing that I was most worried about when he was appointed. So, I did a bit of research. It seems like he has a decent record with giving minutes to academy graduates at PSG, but it's also worth pointing out that they're not really the greatest club to use for an example, considering how sort of notorious they are for undervaluing their, you know, academy players, academy graduates. So you can't really make any concrete conclusions uh, from that. Something I've always said, particularly at Chelsea, 
is that there are words. I mean, it's obvious, but there are words and then there are actions. I think Jose Mourinho's famous quote that he'd be a failure if he didn't make Lewis Baker, Izzy Brown and Dom Solanke England internationals. That quote is kind of ever present in my head whenever I think or talk about these kind <laughs> of things. Um, and, you know, Tuchel in his press conferences, he's been he's been gushing really about the the importance of the academy and things like that. But, you know, as I say, it remains to be seen whether he'll whether he'll walk the walk after having talked the talk like so many previous Chelsea managers didn't. Yeah, no, I, I can see where you're coming from because obviously it's, I mean, it's difficult to, to predict the future, you know, <laughs> yeah, of course. that is just, that is the nature of the beast essentially. And um, obviously results will dictate what happens with, with Tuchel and, and obviously with Chelsea. So um, yeah, I, I think it's, it would be it would be very um it would be a bit crass for me to to suggest it was completely a short termist approach because as with anybody you know you go through a trial period and you know if if you do well then your employer is going to want to keep you essentially so yeah I, I do know um, I do know where you're coming from there but um in terms of the academy um, just going into that uh, obviously it's you know it's it's arguably the best academy setup in in England in English football because of how many top level players it has produced you know the the i mean the EFL is littered with with Chelsea academy graduates and that's even before we get to sort of the players that are in Chelsea's first team um you know there there was that i mean there's there's quite a few famous photos from Cobham um but there's the the picture of um I think it's Reese James, Conor Gallagher, um, Jan Paveda, who's at Leeds, Mark Gurhi, um, and then you know there's a few other young players there who, well, I mean they're all about nine or ten at that point, but the vast majority have gone on to have professional careers. You know, there's, I mean, is there some, is there something in the water? I mean, what is it? What is it at Cobham that you know makes these players into professionals? You know, is it the coaching setup? Is it, um, is is there a philosophy, a mentality that is just instilled, or is it something to do sort of before that and there's are just a really, really solid like, sort of scouting pathway? Well, I think it's a bit of both, really. I think, yeah, first and foremost, the scouts are excellent, the coaches are excellent, and, you know, you don't really have to be an expert to say that because it's quite evident in, in the players that have been p- produced from the academy. You can say that, you know, first of all, you know, to pick up players like um, Callum hudson Doy, Mason Mount at such a young age, you know, obviously the scouts are excellent. And then... Um, you know, to the coaches, you know, there are so many coaches who have come through the Chelsea Academy who in their own right are very good coaches and are applying their trade somewhere else in in the world right now and, and are doing well as well. Um, if I want to talk about what's different about Cobham, I think this is done at most academies, but Chelsea do put a specific kind of clear focus on playing players in different multiple positions as they go up through their age groups. You know, it's quite well known that players like um, Reese James and Fikayo Tomori, they used to be strikers when they were younger. Tammy Abraham, he used to be a defender. He said that in a in an interview a few months ago. I think a few people were surprised, but, you know, it didn't surprise me because, you know, another one, Conor Gallagher, he was actually a wide player until about under 15 level. Um, but within that, they wouldn't have only played those positions. You know, they wouldn't have just played as a striker. Gallagher wouldn't have just played as a winger. Abraham wouldn't have just played as a centre-back. There's lots of moving players around, you know, within the season, within, you know, even games in a week or games in a month. And what you get as a result of that is players who are developed as really well-rounded. And, you know, obviously that makes them more ready than others to do a, a job in senior football. And I think the other thing to say is that the Chelsea Academy is actually quite famed for having a, a bit of a winning mentality. Um, and I think the the head of Academy, Neil Barth, and his assistant, Jim Fraser, they really pride themselves on that. It's seen as quite a, I guess, a vital part of the Chelsea DNA and the philosophy of the Academy, if you, if you want to call it that. Um, you know, obviously there's a large onus on playing out from the back and playing good football, you know, right throughout the age groups. But I think Chelsea are quite clear on it that there's it's absolutely not a necessity you know if a more direct style of football is needed or required in order to win a certain game then there won't be any hesitation to go to that you know there's no sort of sticking to principles type thing that um, you might see an academy like I don't know Barcelona or in England Man City and you know I'm by no means am I saying that that's a bad thing but it's just kind of highlighting the difference between that and what Chelsea do and, you know, they obviously they've got loads of trophies to show for it. You know, they've won the FA Cup, sorry, FA Youth Cup 
um, nine times in total, five consecutive titles between 2014 and 2018. So yeah, there's a there's a very clear um, winning mentality, which I think um, the yeah they pride themselves on that. And as well, when you when you get that reputation, uh, when your academy has such a you know a, a standing in, in English football, you know it then becomes hard to turn down. If some if you've got if you're a really talented young player and you've got offers from a, a whole host of clubs, then the vast majority of the time Chelsea is going to be, uh, at, if not at the very top, then it's going to be in and amongst the um, the the top of those that you're going to be sort of wanting to go to because you know that there is the chance that you're probably going to make it professional um yeah you know better you know better than if you were going to go somewhere which i don't know perhaps was a little bit closer to home a little bit more convenient um that sort of thing so yeah and and, and of course you know w- i spoke to um jordan Jarrett Bryan about um south london having one of the most diverse talent pools in in world in the in, in the world essentially um so you know having that on on your doorstep um to <laughs> go and scout from um is obviously going to be a massive massive advantage yeah um but Speaking of sort of the the uh, the, the players um, that, that come through Chelsea's academy set, uh, set up, uh, and obviously you know the, the, the likes of the Mason Mounts, the Reese Jameses, etc. You know, they, everybody knows about them. You know, they're, they're very their pathways and their success have been very well documented, essentially. Um, but I think a few of the others who are sort of coming up now. I mean, you mentioned one, Conor Gallagher, of course. Uh, you know, he's had loans, Charlton, Swansea, um, currently with West Brom. Um, Trevor Shalaba, um, who's out in France at the moment. Uh, Amanda Broha, um, you'll have to correct me on my pronunciation there, actually, who's who's out um, with Vitesse in, in the Netherlands. Uh, and, and Ike Ogbo, who is, um, who's been, you know, for the past two years, been playing um, uh, at, at Roda JC in, in, in the Netherlands and, and is currently with Circle Bruges um, in, in Belgium. You know, there's Obviously, the loan. I mean, one thing I don't want to get into is the whole. Oh, look, the Chelsea loan circuit. <laughs> da, 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 that's been done to death. And also, I just don't think it's a very fruitful conversation topic. But what I would like to discuss is those four players, those those named loanees, because you know you've you, you've got two players there, two forwards who are scoring pretty regularly in Belgium and Holland. Have been for the past two years in Ugbo's case, uh, and then you've got two midfield players um, who you know are doing very well but at a level which is lower than what would be required to play for Chelsea right now I just wanted to gauge your your opinion on on sort of those those four and and what you really think of them yeah I'll start with EK Ugbo because um I think he's quite an interesting one um from a sort of wider um point of view thinking about just player development oh sorry player development in general I know you didn't did a brilliant piece and interview with him Joe a a few months ago um sort of on this topic but Ike Ugbo is a player who came through a striker who came through the the Chelsea Academy you know obviously by virtue of that he's you know developed a very kind of um good link-up play very good one-touch finishing I think actually 80% 80% of his goals this season for Circle Bruges have been one touch finishes. He's he's quite yeah. um you know that's that's something that he's he prides prides his game on. Um a poacher a poacher in old money. Yeah, absolutely. Um and he went on loan um at the age of 18, 19 to um various clubs in the EFL, Scunthorpe, MK Dons and I think he scored about one or two goals um you know in about three loan spells. Um and, you know, as a result, obviously, he was um, quite widely written off. I'm not sure if he was kind of big enough to for that to hit the mainstream media at the time. But, you know, I'm sure behind the scenes as well, people at clubs will be looking at him and thinking, you know, Chelsea Academy, yeah, they develop players, but their strikers aren't great because all they know how to do is finish. They don't develop other parts of their game. But I think it just really goes to show that development is not linear. Um and, you know, he was on loan at Roda JC in, in the Erste Divisie, the Dutch second division last season. I think he, 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 yeah, he got into double figures for goals. I can't remember the exact amount. Um, he did very well there. Um, it was a, a very kind of well-chosen step up this season to Circle Bruges in, in Belgium. Um, they're really struggling this season, Bruges. They're, they're, they're um, you know, in the rele- relegation zone, but he, he's scoring regularly. I think he's got about 12 goals this season so far. Um, and you know, his goals are, are verified by, uh, the expected goals gods. So he's not overperforming. Mm-hmm. He's not, um, kind of, just, we'd love to see. yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, it's really, it'll be very interesting to see what he 
chooses to do with his career now because his contract is up with Chelsea in the summer. I highly doubt he'll renew because, you know, he's finally kind of come into form and, you know, there were rumours that Chelsea rejected a bid of five million pounds, I think it was, from FC Rostov uh, in Russia in the January transfer window for him. So, you know, there will clearly be clubs on his tail in the summer transfer window. And it'll be interesting to see what he does because, you know, obviously he made a, well, I'm not sure if it was him who made the choice or Chelsea or whatever, but it was a very good choice made, um, the step up from the Dutch second division to the Belgian first division last season. Um, but it'll be interesting to to see where he where he takes that next step up. Yeah, it was. Um, I think it it was his call. Um, he had a few offers from elsewhere. Um, to 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 go out on loan. Uh, and it was sort of he. I remember him saying to me that he had he discussed it with his with his dad. And and you know it was a it was a question of you know I don't really have anything to lose here by going abroad. Um, you know I could potentially play myself back into contention essentially. Um, and I think that's you know that's, that's what he's done. I think. Um, sort of, if if he were to return to England um, in in the close season, um, once his contract expires, then you know there's there's nothing to say that I think he, he could get a he, he could get a, squ- a squad place at a, a, a very very decent club. Um, whether that would be sort of top half of the Championship uh, or bottom half of the Premier League, I think that would probably be the area that we're talking in. Um, but yeah, it's um it's 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 a it's a good little tale to to see of um how how you know you can you can you know pick yourself back up after being written off after after maybe not hitting the the heights in the EFL which so so many players just don't don't do but that's not sort of a reflection of their quality um with with Broha he is uh, on loan at Vitesse at the moment and I know you've just written uh for for us uh, a fantastic piece um which uh, uh which dropped into our emails today and uh, I did have a sort of a little sneak peek and have a little bit of a read uh, of that um so I did get a little bit more clued up on on him than than I was beforehand. But um, I mean, take it away, Orlando. Yeah, tell me tell me more about Armando Broja. Yeah. So first thing to say is it's actually Armando Broja. Sorry to correct you on that. It's, oh it's a, no, it's a hard <laughs> I've J. I've said it four times, <laughs> and you know that's <laughs> hard. Yeah, you know, I've I've got that from someone who knows him. So I think you can we can take that as the truth. It's a hard J. Yeah, we can take that um, golden. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, I think he's a player who's actually gone under the radar a little bit this season I'm not sure um I think people would be surprised perhaps to hear that he's the highest scoring teenager in the top 10 leagues in Europe this season um you know um if you use UEFA's league ranking coefficient I think the the only other teenager um who has more goals than him who's kind of a big name in in the mainstream is Abdel Asima of Slavia Prague but the Czech league is is ranked 12th in UEFA's um, coefficient system so you know that can be disregarded for, for this um, stat um, for these purposes exactly um, but yeah he the first thing to say to him to say about him is obviously he he's excellent at scoring goals and particularly that he scores lots of different types of goals he's um, during his time at Vitesse you know it's his first um, season in men's football um, he's got I think 10 goals or so um, so far in under 2,000 minutes, which is very impressive. Um, he scored rebounds. He scored headers. He scored from cutbacks. He scored from from solo runs. He scored lots of different types of goals. Um, and, you know, that's really impressive for someone, you know, obviously only playing his first season um, with men. Um, but he's also really, really excellent at running the channels um, and buying team, sorry, buying time for both himself and his team. Um, He's really good at kind of holding off defenders whilst um, manipulating the ball with sort of little um, cute touches um, to keep it away from them. Um, And, you know, that obviously opens up space and the way I expanded on this more in the piece, but the way Vitesse play, they attack with great pace. So when he kind of occupies multiple defenders at once that can open that can be really effective in opening up more space for um, his teammates to attack and you know you know go and get a a chance Um, but yeah I think he'll be an interesting one to watch because it is evident when you watch him play that his all-round game does have um, a long way to go you know he's not very refined yet and you know you would expect that of a of a 19 year old but he scores lots of goals. Um, he's got a great kind of imposing physical fr- frame. Um, he's great at holding holding the ball up when running the channels. He could do more with his back to goal 
Um, but, you know, these are things that, that strikers will learn. Um, and in the piece, I made a, a comparison between him and, and Dominic Solanke, who also spent his first season in, in senior football on loan at Vitesse. And I think it'll be interesting to see how, how Bridges' career pans out um, um, in comparison with Solanke's. Yeah, well, I mean, his international career has already been take has already taken off uh, yeah. a little bit better than than Solanke's, given that he's um he's actually played sixty minutes on the same pitch as England um in uh, Albania's uh, World Cup qualifying defeat um uh, the other day, um but yeah, I'm glad that you corrected me on Broja there. It's going to very much come in come in handy when I'm when I'm uh, pretending to be the authority on him in future. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I've got I've actually I've got it on good authority that it's a hard J. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 going to be the way these those conversations go. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, those two, uh, Ugbo and, and, and Broja, were definitely two that I, I was intrigued to, 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 to hear about from, from your side of things. Um, just quickly, just quickly on um, Chalabar and Gallagher, um, you know, do, do you see potentially in future that them being Chelsea's level, being Champions League level, or are we going to see sort of probably a similar situation to Ugbo where they've done well, but perhaps not well enough to oust the players in their positions at sort of the base of midfield? Well, I think Conor Gallagher potentially could be... Well, actually, I think there's a very good chance of him being mm. a Chelsea player in the long term. Um, I don't think he'll be a starter. Um, I'm not sure if he has quite has the individual quality for that, but he's a player who's very comfortable at both six... Sorry, all three of six, eight and ten. So he can play any midfield mm. role. He can play out wide. He's a manager's dream. He's a bit like Mason Mount in that sense. You know, he's very tactically aware. He does the basics brilliantly. You know, he never wastes time on the ball, never takes extra touches. His passing is very crisp and sort of refined. And, you know, he's got very good technical ability uh, to go on top of that as well. So I think he'll, he's kind of your dream, I guess, 23rd man in an international squad or squad player in the Premier League. So I think, you know, if he wants to be a starter, maybe he won't be playing at Chelsea level or at least not for a few years but I think you know even this summer or maybe next summer he can come back to Chelsea and play a you know a good 1,000-2,000 minutes in a season. Yeah I think that's I'd I'd probably agree with you there on Gallagher because um, you know seeing him at Charlton he was in a in a reasonably you know rudimentary uh, championship team at at that time under Lee Boyer you know he was that real spark of quality and as you were saying you know he his his ability to dig in to tuck in as 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 a as a bit of a six um when when Charlton were really under the cosh was impressive but then his ability to sort of break forward and, and really add goals at the other end of the pitch um was 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 really good and then obviously at Swansea um he turned into very much a creative force um and this season in the Premier League has obviously been you know a, a huge education for him um at West Brom so yeah i, I think He's, he's very much on an upward trajectory. The other thing to say about him is more about kind of how he is as a person and his mentality. You know, he he spent six months in a team in the bottom half of the championship. He spent six months in a team in the top half of the championship and he went straight to Premier League. And, you know, he's being awarded man of the match awards in the Premier League, proving that he can be the best player on the pitch in, in Premier League games. And he's done that all in the space of kind of 18 months. Um, and, you know, if he can develop that far in 18 months, then, you know, you never know what the future might hold. Well, exactly. And he's just such a, such an energy man as well. Yeah. yeah. I saw him describe, I can't remember who it was, but it was, it was following the England game. You know, he's, I think it was sort of a backhanded compliment in that sense, but I'm, I'm very much using it as a, as a compliment <laughs> because he just has that ceaseless, boundless energy that just keeps him going, keeps him running through games. He's constantly at, you know, when he's off the ball, he's constantly at the opposition's heels. You know, when he's on it, he's constantly looking to make those passes. No, there's no, there's no fat to his game. You know, there's, it's very much, you know, cut and dry. Yeah. I'm going to do this, that, bish, bash, bosh. This is, this is how it's going to be done. Um, yeah, I'm, 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 a, I'm a very big fan of Gallagher. So, yeah, it, it's nice to, to sort of see that my own opinion, or, or rather my own hopes have been validated by yourself there, um, that, that p- potentially he could be um, sort of uh, a Chelsea player in the future. Um, sticking with sort of that general position in, in midfield, um, but obviously more sort of towards, geared towards the base, um, is, is Billy Gilmore who um, is still a teenager, I believe, um, but has sort of had a few uh, a few outings in this Chelsea team this season. Um, obviously came in, wasn't a, a, a Chelsea Academy, you know, brought through from the age of six, seven, was brought in at the age 15, 16 from Rangers uh, in Scotland. Um, and I've, I've been impressed, you know, with what I've seen of him. I think he dictates the tempo really well. Um, but 
is there is there any indication of what the plan is for him sort of in this first team? Because, you know, he's played the vast majority of his minutes in, in the FA Cup against sort of, you know, Morecambe, Luton, Barnsley, Sheffield United. So not the highest level of opposition, but, you know, what is the what are you gauging from from sort of his first full season um, in, in senior football? Well, the first thing I'd say is that it hasn't really been a full season in senior football for him. Like he's he's had a few small injuries under Lampard. He was struggling to get into the team, struggling to get onto the bench at times. You know, he he was out injured for um, mm. for I think until December. He he started his first game back in a dead rubber against Krasnodar in the final um, group stage game of the Champions League, and he he looked really bright and positive actually he was he was one of the best players uh that day but you know it is a bit frustrating because it was almost a year ago to the day well I think more like a year and a month ago now um that he he made his his bow under the Stamford Bridge lights um in the FA Cup against Liverpool um and you know he was awarded man of the match that day and then a few days later he he got man of the match again in in the 4-0 win over Everton and that was when he really kind of first came to the limelight and then you know the coronavirus um induced lockdown hit um and that momentum was put on hold and then you know in project restart he played a few games but then he got um a really nasty knee injury which which I mentioned kept him out for quite a while so this season you know it's been hard for him because obviously he came back in December and then not that long after Lampard was gone so um under Tuchel, he's, you know, found it hard to get a look in in general, but Tuchel's been very kind of um, adamant that he's a player of real quality when when speaking in his press conferences. You know, he said, he basically said, you know, I, I love Billy. He's a brilliant player, but he's got three big problems. And those three big problems are Angolo Kante, Mateo Kovacic and Jorginho. Because obviously the mm. system that Tuchel's playing at the moment, it only has two central midfielders. You've got three, three there. Um who are, you know, quite clearly ahead of him. You know, I have my own opinions on on whether that should be the case, but it's quite clear what Tuchel thinks. Um, and, you know, I guess in terms of a uh, hierarchical thing, you, you struggle to kind of give him a big argument on that. Um, but, you know, he's played a few games for the under-23s just to keep his match sharpness up recently. Um, but, you know, you mentioned his games in the FA Cup against those lower-level sides. He has definitely look to step up in those in those matches you know he he's he definitely is ready to play at a higher level and you know that was demonstrated when he as I said when he when he played against Liverpool and Everton so well you know a year ago but it's just a bit of a frustrating situation you hope that he can start to get more game time next year particularly if if Tuchel um if Tuchel um, moves to a midfield three, there are indications that he might do that next season. You know, Joe, you mentioned, um, you refer to him as as someone at the base of midfield, but I think he's potentially even better as a number eight or at least just as good. So, you know, he can play both roles. Um, and, you know, it'll be interesting to see to see whether he gets that game time. If not, I, I am probably in favour of a loan, but I definitely wasn't in favour of one in January because January loans are just, basically a bit rubbish they're very volatile you know you have to hit the ground running and and they're very kind of they produce very low levels of success typically yeah I'm I'm not a fan of January loans either Um, I've also just looked at Billy Gilmore's minutes for this season and turns out that he's played 700 and 240 of those were for the 23s so there you go yeah don't don't listen to me on um on whether on on who has had a first full season of senior (laughs) football because clearly Billy Gilmore has not and I've not done my research which has been exposed um but no I'm I I I do know where you're coming from with sort of the, the the eight versus six chatter um you know because he does have that skill set where he, you do you look at him and you think that you know he could probably you know if he refined his game he could probably you know be a, 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 a you know to to a certain extent quite press resistant um you know evade pressure quite well very similar to Gallagher in this in the sort of isolated sense that you know he'll probably he'll release the ball very quickly be very good with his passing very crisp with his decision making um and i think as you were saying with the um, the FA Cup games you know he did demonstrate that against um against lesser opposition uh, obviously playing in a team which dominated the ball but yeah I, I'm, I've got I've got hopes for him um, certainly but I think 
yeah, as you were saying, well, as Thomas Tuchel was saying, of course, the the obstacles in his way are quite considerable, given the the quality and the and you know the world renowned quality that is ahead of him in in that position. So, yeah, it'll be an interesting one to see see what happens really. And and to be honest, I just hope he gets sort of a, a few more minutes between now and the end of the season, um, you yeah. know, off the bench. Speaking more of of the twenty threes, um, given that Billy Gilmore has played almost just as much twenty threes football <laughs> this season as he has first team, um, Tino Angerin is is somebody who I've, I've followed for, for for quite a while, simply because he just looks far far too good for for sort of reserve football or you know not the the level below men's football. Um, and obviously, he recently signed a, a new deal at Chelsea until twenty twenty five. And as I just said, you know, he's been sort of charting at a level which has been, you know, which has been better than sort of the best team in um, Premier League 2, which is obviously the, the competition Chelsea's uh, under 23s play in. Um, but I suppose it's a similar sort of, a similar question. You know, he's, he's, he's an attacking player, but where does a promising young attacking player coming through Chelsea's academy get his minutes when you've got Havertz, Werner, Mount, Z- uh, Ziyech, Callum Hudson Odoi ahead. You know, it's is it a similar story to to what we've just discussed on Billy Gilmore. Yeah, it is a similar story, but I think it's to an even greater extent, really, particularly in this formation that Tuchel's now playing, which is basically only three attackers. You know, you've got all those players ahead of him, um, and you know, usually it's only two of those players because you've got a number nine as well. Um, so it's it's very difficult for him to find minutes. He finds himself in a bit of a a hard predicament at the moment because um you know he as you say he's very clearly too good for for under 23s football i think he he outgrew premier league 2 football quite a while ago but you know he's been playing there uh, for for a while since um and kind of coasting along it's very evident to see when you watch him play just on a physical level you know he looks like a man and particularly relative to the players around him even if they're you know a similar size it really does look like I know this is a huge cliche but it really does look like a a man amongst boys Um, and he's just he's very very big powerful strong but very very graceful on the ball Um, he he has a a really lovely kind of running style when carrying the ball um, where he's you know he's got really good agility for for his size he's about six foot one six foot two and he's quite wide um but yeah he's he's someone who I think almost definitely well he should go out on loan next season and he almost definitely will again like Billy Gilmore I don't think a January loan was a good idea particularly because you know he's training with the first team I think there's a lot to be said about um training with the first team for a player like him you know underneath these players that we're mentioning um just learning off them and you know another big thing is you know if he's out on loan the high likelihood is is Tuchel you know is not watching him or maybe doesn't even know who he is and if he's training you know day in day out under Tuchel's very own nose very on ah, under Tuchel's very own eyes um you know he he's kind of made himself much more evident to the manager and that's you know a very big thing for someone like him who if he does end up going out on loan will want to come back and, and play more significant minutes so yeah I think he should go out on loan next season um, but for the time being training with the first team is not necessarily a terrible thing. Yeah that's one thing that I also think is that you know if if you've got to the point where you've outgrown under 23's football but there is a plan for you then you know perhaps rushing that loan isn't the best thing to do. Like, Absolutely. You know what is what is going to be the best thing for him? It's going to be working under those players that we, you know, those first team players that we just listed, um, you know, working alongside them, getting to know the manager, getting to know the way that the team plays that, so that when he does go out on loan and then he returns, it's not a complete shock to the system, or at least theoretically it wouldn't be. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a very, very big fan of, of, of Andrew because, um, I can't remember. It was in an FA Youth Cup game because w- one thing I should say is that Andrin is is only nineteen still. But you know the description that Orlando's just given there is is of a player who's perhaps a few years older. Yeah. No, he is still he's still a teenager, and but he's you know physically you know he- I'm going to use a, a similar cliche to boys amongst men, but he's head and shoulders above um, everybody else at, at that level. Um, and and that's been clear as as you said for for quite some time. Um, there was a, there was an FA Youth Cup game though. I can't remember who it was against. Um, but there was just a re- amazing dribble that he, where he just kind of just breezed past everyone uh, and then and then applied the finish. Yeah, and- I think that was against against Wolves. It was a really brilliant goal. 
Yeah, was was that one one of the emphatic wins? Um, because yeah, I, mean, I think it was seven one or something like that. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, I mean that was yeah that was quite quite something to to witness from him. But yeah, Tino Andrian, I think he could certainly go. He, I mean, he could drop into the championship. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm almost certain. Um, and do you know s- similar things to what Conor Gallagher did at, at Swansea and Charlton in terms of you know having that impact, obviously in a in a more advanced position. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm. I'm very, very certain that you know this this summer that he would be able to do that. It's it's not really a question of if, it's when, really, isn't it? The other thing I should say about Andrin um, is that when he was in the under 18s, uh, Jody Morris, who was his manager at the time, described him as the best finisher at the club. So not just in the under 18 squad, not just in the academy as a whole, at the whole club, he described he was described as the best finisher, and I think. You know, it's interesting because that's not necessarily something you would associate with someone of his kind of build and, you know, just looking at, you know, what he looks like as a player. But when you see him play, he's really got an eye for goal. He's got fantastic ball striking, but also really good composure. And, you know, that that's seen in, in Jody Morris's assessment of his finishing skill. Yeah. And another thing about Andrew, which I, I absolutely love, is that I got it right. It's a hard J in yeah. this one as well. So yeah. I'm very, very <laughs> pleased about that one. Um, speaking of... of, of uh, players who are sharpshooters and, and very good finishers. Um, we're going to drop even further down to, to the under-18s, uh, and that's to discuss Jude Sunsup-Bell, uh, who's got 12 goals for the under-18s this season uh, in, in the under-18 Premier League, um, but has also already played seven times for the 23s. Um, and he is, you know, he's, he's 2004 born, and, you know, there are not too many 2004s playing um, PL2 Division One football at the moment. So that's, you know, that's that's a flag in itself. Um you know, there was there was also the the FA Youth Cup game against Barnsley, which he scored four in. Which again, you know, the, the, there do tend to be quite a few emphatic FA Youth Cup victories for for Chelsea, but that one was a was a very emphatic one for Sunsup Bell. Um, I I haven't actually watched m- very much of him. You know, I've only watched sort of highlights of his. Um, but from from your perspective as a Chelsea fan, you know, and, and sort of within the Chelsea fan base you know what has the has there been much discussion has there been much intrigue over you know this this young striker who's who's bagging goals well if anything I I mean this is a bit boring but I do think there's a little bit too much hype around him in the the Chelsea fan base just because you know he is only 17 um and only just turned 17 at that um and you know you see on Twitter these these funny things of you know um him being compared to like Bruno Fernandes, you know, a player oh, who no. doesn't even share the same <laughs> position of it as him and stuff like that. And you just have to laugh it off. You know, it's not kind of, you know, it's always, you know, humorous to an extent. But, um, you know, him as a player, I think obviously he's a fantastic talent and, and he's a great player, but he's also a really interesting one um, from a kind of analytical point of view um, with regard to strikers from the Chelsea Academy, because he is... If you think about all the strikers who have come through, you know, your Tammy Abrahams, your E.K. Ugbos, who we've discussed um, previously in the pod, but he is someone who, at the tender age of 17, has got really, really good back-to-goal play. So he ho- he's not huge. You know, he's quite tall, but he's quite slender as well. But he holds the ball up really, really well. Um, he played midfield until, I think, he was about 14 or 15. So he's got you know, a very good passing range for a number nine. He's got good, obviously very good ball striking ability, but that's not just seen as shooting. It's also seen in, in his passing. Um, and, you know, he's very two footed. I think um, in the, I think it was his first Premier League two start. Actually, he scored within about five minutes on his left foot from outside the box, his weaker left foot against Man United. Um, and that was, you know, obviously really impressive, but it just goes to show what a kind of well-rounded player is player he is and I think he's potentially one of the most well-rounded strikers at his age to ever come out of the Chelsea Academy and I just realized that I've complained about people overhyping him and I've just said something that is probably going to cause quite a lot of hype about him but you know obviously he is only 17 and all these things are said with you know the with the knowledge that you know development isn't linear and, and anything can happen in the future. What have we done? What have we done? We've 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 set we've set a conversation. We've set a narrative now. Uh, I mean, I think I should probably say as sort of a public service announcement: don't go comparing uh, June Soon Sup Bell to Bruno Fernandez <laughs> or or any or anybody like that for that matter. Because you know, it's just let, let these players develop. Let them develop. Uh, we may be talking about them because you know it's nice to get in nice and early, but 
yeah, let them let them take their time uh, and go up through the, the increments. Um, yeah, absolutely. But um, that's all for, for this Chelsea special. Um, uh, I think one thing I've, I've learned from this is that perhaps I'd need to do a bit more homework on which players have hard and silent J's in their names. And, and perhaps <laughs> I should watch a little watch a little bit more of Billy Gilmore, to say the least. Um, but Orlando, it's been a pleasure um, hosting you. Um, if anybody wants to hear more from, from him, do check out uh, the Chelsea spot um, for, for pods and articles, threads and stuff like that. Um, is, is there anything more that you, you have to add? No, just to say it was it was my pleasure, really. I really, really enjoyed coming on and uh, had great fun talking to you. So thanks to you, Joe. It's always good to sort of talk about, um, you know, the, the younger players at a, at a top, top level club um, because, you know, it's it's interesting to see which ones that in a year, two, three years down the line that, you know, we can look back on this and think, well, oh, actually, yeah, you know, we, we did think about um, Tino Andrew and now oh, he's gone out on loan to whatever club and he's absolutely killed it. So yeah, it would be nice. It would be nice for that to happen. I'm not saying it will, but um, yeah, <laughs> it would, it would be, um, it would be, it would be very uh, gratifying and validating, but you yeah, know, yeah. it's been, it's been a pleasure um, hosting you, but um, yeah, if you would like to um, hear more on uh, Chelsea yet, yeah, do check out Orlando's podcast. Um, but that is all from us on the Scouted Football podcast. Um, for more Scouted Football content, do get over to scoutedftbl.com uh, and also to our Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash Scouted Football. You can get access to an extra podcast per month on there uh, and lots of exclusive articles and, and, and feature pieces on our Patreon there um, I've been Joe Donoghue you've been listening to the Scout Football Podcast thank you very much for tuning in take care bye for now